Life Audio. Hey, my friends, welcome back to How to Study the Bible. I am your host, Nicole Eunice, and I am really excited to be with you today and to continue our Bible study right now. We're doing a little mini series called When Faith Fails. So we'll get into that in just a moment. But before we do, I want to thank you guys. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to leave five star reviews, to even leave written reviews to go on to all of the places, Goodreads and Amazon and calling your libraries and telling your churches and, you know, going on Apple and Spotify and all the places that you all have showed up and left five-star reviews or left comments about my books or this ministry. You know, it's it's not, I mean, of course, like I'm so grateful for the encouragement, truly. It's so encouraging, but it's not really about that for me as much as it, as it is about the fact that we together around the world are leveraging technology as a way to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, When you leave those reviews, when you leave that comment, it actually, in the algorithm, it it allows more people to see it. And when more people see it, they may get curious. They might see, you know, a, a podcast title or a book title that they think, oh man, that speaks to what's really going on in my life. And it's a way for us to spread the gospel together. It's a way to evangelize together in the neighborhood that is our world, which is a very connected world. So it feels like the whole world is our neighborhood when we're out in the land of technology. So you guys are what makes that happen. And the fact that there are hundreds of reviews on this podcast and over a million downloads and the way that you guys have supported my latest book called Not What I Signed Up For, which again is all about encouraging people's faith. For those who have never been home to the Lord, for those who strayed far away from their heart's home, because life's been difficult for those who feel like maybe their sufferings or their challenges have been underrepresented or pushed aside or they haven't felt cared for in what is really going on in their life. My heart and my desire alongside of you guys is that they might rediscover the power of a relationship with God and rediscover the love that God has for them through his word and that we would be able to do that in the way that we study the Bible together, the way that we bring a message to them. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. It means so much. And also, I'm really excited that we are going to walk through the Not What I Signed Up For message together starting next week right here on the podcast. So we're going to do a six-week study on the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis. And we are going to be following along with the book and Bible study. So you can pick up that book and Bible study anywhere books are sold. We also put in the show notes for you. You don't have to have the book or Bible study. Like everything on this podcast is free. That's how we do it. You don't have to have either one of those. I do think that the the messages are there for you and for encouraging you. And so if you if you do want to participate and grab the Bible study and really dig in and have kind of a five day a week experience with God as you're really working through what I personally like think is my favorite story in all of scripture about Joseph, then definitely go grab the book or Bible study. But we also have a free prayer guide for you as we go through the the content together in the next six weeks. You can grab that prayer guide at NicoleUnis.com slash not what I signed up for. I know that's super long, but stick it in your browser. You'll get there. Go over there, grab the download, and then we will be working through the podcast together. So maybe let a friend know. You guys can listen to the podcast independently and then talk about it when you're together. That's one of the ways people like to use podcasts is like kind of as a group teaching. So would love to do that. And we will start with the Not What I Signed Up For content next week. So thank you. Leave that five-star review. Pass on the podcast. Go grab a book. It would bless me. It will bless the ministry. And let's get into our word for today. All right, my friends, hopefully you are listening and have listened to last week because this is kind of part two on this idea of what do we do when our faith fails. And we are looking at the story of Gideon in the book of Judges. And if you don't know anything about Judges, it was a dark time in Israel's history and we're in the Old Testament. And we're looking at some stories of how God showed up and worked through ordinary people. And our ordinary person of the day is Gideon. Gideon was, as he self-professes, the least in the clan and the least of his family. Um, And he sort of shows up with a lot of like fear and trepidation and maybe even some skepticism. And God continues to engage him. 
And so Gideon, we left off in the end of chapter six, Gideon has asked God for a sign because he's gone and done the first courageous thing that God asked him to do. But what God has really told Gideon is you yourself are going to be the one who delivers the Israelites from the Midianites. The Israelites were oppressed. The Midianites were overwhelming them, and they needed to get out of the situation they were in. And Gideon was chosen to be the leader in a very unexpected way. So Gideon's done the first thing that he was supposed to do, part one. He's done the first thing he was supposed to do. It was scary. He did it at night because he was scared. And now God is saying, now it's time. It's time, Gideon. You've done the first thing. Now you're going to do the big thing, and you're going to go out there, and you are going to lead the people. And then Gideon says to God, we're in chapter 6, the very end, verse 36, if you save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, he's asking for another sign. I'll place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. So this is a conversation happening between Gideon and God where God is saying, okay, Gideon, you need to go do the thing. You've got to go live into your faith. And Gideon's like, can I get, can I get another sign? <laughs> can I get another sign? And so he asks, he, he kind of goes into this like very strange thing. And and we actually use the idiom, like I laid out a fleece. Like that's actually like a thing that's said in the English language. It actually is referring to this exact moment in the Bible. And what Gideon does, he lays out a fleece. He takes like a piece of a sheep, a wool fleece, like a little piece of sheepskin. And he lays it out and he says, okay, I'm going to put this out on the threshing floor. And if if the fleece is wet, but all the ground around it is dry, then I know you're going to save Israel, just like you said. And so exactly what he wanted to have happen happens. Gideon wakes up in the morning. He goes and he sees that the fleece is full of water, but the land around it is dry. And then Gideon says, um, actually, can you do like one more thing? This time, can the fleece be dry and the ground wet? Which first, I, I know I... I love the Bible. I think you guys know that. And I think that God has an incredible sense of humor. And the way people act and what happens in the Bible is just so human to me. And this is such a, I don't know why this is so funny to me that this is the way that Gideon is going to get his answer. He's like, I've got this, hey, I've got this like sheepskin rug. Can you make it wet and then dry and then dry and then wet? And then I'll really know that you're God. So he does that. And God, and God does it. Like, God in his graciousness and and in his mercifulness, he doesn't strike Gideon down. He doesn't blow him up. He doesn't burn anything up. He doesn't say, what's wrong with you, man? Why are you asking me for a sign? He just does it. And after he does it, Gideon gathers his energy and gathers his faith. And he's sent out to show, to go do the thing that God has told him to do. And in chapter seven, something happens here where It's like Gideon had his faith tested and God received and answered with a sign. And now Gideon's faith is going to be tested in a far greater way that he probably could have never expected. But he's got he's got this moment with God. He's had this experience with God. He's had this little fleece moment. A fleece is is a very low stakes sign. This is a low investment situation where it doesn't impact anyone that Gideon had this moment with God and God showed him through. But now it's going to make a big impact because now Gideon is going to be sent out to overcome the Midianites. And in chapter seven, you can go read it. God is going to now prune down who Gideon gets to take with him into this battle. And when Gideon starts with the battle and he asks the men to come, hey, let's go drive out the Midianites, 32,000 men come out and God says, that's too many. I don't want that many men. It's not going to give me glory. It's not going to give Israel. Everyone's no one's going to know that it was me who did this. So you need to just tell people, hey, if you're scared, you can leave, which also makes me laugh because I think Gideon was probably like, I'm scared. Can I leave? (laughs) But he had had faith. He had received signs. He knew God was with him. He had to keep believing God was with him. And so he stands in front of all these men, 32,000 men, and says, if you are scared, you can leave. Guess how many leave? 22,000. 22,000 of them walk away. I mean, it must have been like crickets. So they must have looked around and been like, oh my gosh, everyone left. Joe, Kevin, Paul, Ryan, they all left. All five of my buddies, they're gone. It's just there's only a few left. And then God says to Gideon, that's still too many. That is still too many. And I want to have my glory be known through this experience. So I'm going to need you to do something else. And the Lord says to Gideon, this is in chapter 7, verse 4, there's still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you. 
if I say this one shall go with you, he'll go. And if I say this one shouldn't go with you, who won't? So Gideon takes the men down to the water. And the Lord says, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel to drink. So the idea here is that there's some that are going to get all the way down by the river and like put their face in the water, right? And then there's those who are going to squat down and like pull the water up to their mouth. And when they do that, only 300 of them drink from their cupped hands. The rest of them like kneel down by the river. And so the Lord said to Gideon, just take the 300 that lapped and I'll save you. Now, this is interesting because if you think about it, like there's a level of being alert if you're not going to like lay down by the river and put your face in it. Like you're a little bit more ready for battle if you're like, hey, I'm going to stay on alert. I'm going to reach down into the water. I'm not going to like put my guard down. And the reality was 7,700 of those men were like, maybe not the right ones for the job. And so now he has 300 men. He went from 32,000 men to 300 men. And God says, this is how it's going to be done. So I bring all of this to your attention when we talk about this idea of faith and what happens. We ask for a sign. We see God work. We know God is who he is. Maybe you had a moment five years ago or a moment one year ago or last Sunday in church, and you were just so sure that God was with you. And now you're, you're standing in a very hard situation. You have to make hard decisions. You have to do hard things. I think some of us get confused sometimes that faith means that life isn't going to feel hard or faith means that we're not going to have to do hard things. And in reality, faith means you will absolutely do hard things. And the more God believes in your faith, the more hard things you are going to do for his glory and for his good. And the more that I believe that God actually is going to do things that defy like normal, like ways of human beings doing things. And this whole story with Gideon is an absolute defiance to the way you would normally do things. This is not the way that you would run an army. This is not the way that you would run a battle to remove more and more and more people until you are absolutely like up against a wall. There is no way that you're going to succeed against these Midianites with 300 dudes when you could have had 32,000. And that and God says, no, that's the way we're going to do it. So Gideon is in this moment where now he's got only 300. And I want to share this last piece with you. I think this is so beautiful when we think about, remember, we started in part one and said, all we're going to do here really is we're going to ask, what does this teach us about people? What does this teach us about God? What does this teach us about God and people? And so after all of this happens and the, the people are winnowed down and it's going to be time and God says, hey, with these 300 men, I'm going to save you. Send everybody else home. And the camp was below him in the valley. So Gideon is up on the mountain looking down at the camp of Midian. And during the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up and go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. And then he says, if you're afraid, though, like Gideon, if your faith is still failing you, God himself says, if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant and listen to what they're saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So God gives Gideon the option to take another sign. He's like, if you're scared, I'll give you another sign. And you don't have to go, but you can go. And so he does go with this servant and he actually hears and overhears that a man was telling a friend. So they sneak down into the camp and they hear, you know, it's very dark. And he hears one of these Midianites telling another friend, I had a dream. And he tells him this dream where the it says a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the camp and struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. And the friend responds, and this is Gideon is listening and overhearing, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hand. So God, Gideon got to hear that actually the Midianites might be numerous. The Midianites might be powerful. They may be warriors, but in reality, they are really scared. They are really scared of what God's going to do. And so Gideon goes back. You can go read the end of the story, basically, as you imagine. It's a cool story of what happens. God sends confusion into the camp. And so by the time that the Israelites arrive, it's like the thing is already done. <laughs> like God, God does it all. God takes care of it. And the sword is against the Midianites and the Israelites triumph and Gideon leads them. So you can go read all that story. We could obviously spend a lot more time on it. But I want to spend a couple minutes as we think about this story and as you hear this story around this idea of what does this tell us about people? Let's start there. Well, I think this is an inherently human story. And it's inherently human to doubt. It's inherently human to feel like our faith is weak and that our faith falters. And Gideon doesn't just ask for one sign. He asks for signs and signs and signs. 
And God doesn't just provide one side. God, God is the one who often provides a sign for Gideon's behalf. Now, does that mean that God is always going to provide us signs? Not necessarily. This is about a very personal interaction between our personal God and Gideon and Gideon's temperament, Gideon's faith. You know, it says in scripture that measures of faith are given to us. And I believe that God will provide what we need for the measure of faith that we have. And, and the design here is that God is growing our faith. Our belief is constant, but our faith can kind of grow. Our faith can shrink and expand. And God uses hard things in our lives to bring us to these moments where we're like, oh my gosh, I don't have enough faith. I don't have enough faith. God, will you be with me? God, will you come and be with me? And we see in this interaction that God is very willing to meet Gideon with what he needs. Now, does that mean that God is always going to provide signs universally? No, because this is about a personal story about a personal guy and a personal God. And your story is about you, a person with your with a personal God. Our God is a personal God. We do see in scripture that signs and miracles are a part of what God does. But we also see that much of the way a sign and miracle is the intent of it is sometimes not enough and we will be rebuked for that. So in, uh, in the New Testament, It says that Jesus, when he was in John chapter four, he was with a group of people called the Samaritans. And it says that Jesus said, because it it said in scripture, because of his words, many became believers. Like the whole idea that we would believe on just words is a beautiful thing. And a little bit later in that same John in chapter four, he actually rebukes another group of people. And he says to them, you people, unless you see miraculous signs and wonders, you'll never believe. So like the Samaritans were able to believe without signs and wonders, and the Galileans get rebuked by Jesus for needing signs and wonders. So there there is a sense that, yes, God is going to provide signs and wonders. God will meet us in our faith. But sometimes we keep seeking signs and wonders, even though we don't believe, or we keep seeking signs and wonders for our own selfish need. And God's going to work all of that out in us. Um, in the way that he does or does not maybe respond in exactly how we thought that he would. I believe in signs and wonders, but I also believe in a God who says, what did I tell you last? And go do the thing I told you. I also believe in a God who says the signs and wonders of the Bible can be your signs and wonders. Because do you know who is the sign and wonder that we have in our world? Jesus. Jesus is the sign and wonder that we are given. It says in scripture that you will be given a sign. This will be a sign among you. (laughs) The virgin will give birth to a baby and we will call him Jesus. The sign that we have that God can overcome and that God is the one who orders our steps, orders our days and controls life and death is in Jesus. Like the sign has been given. It doesn't mean that we don't continue to interact with God and ask God to show us what he wants and say, Lord, you know, I, I love praying the prayer, God, like I just, you know, the measure of faith that I have. Would you, would you open and close doors to the measure of faith that I have? Would you allow me to persevere and be patient to the measure of faith that you've given? And then my, my desire is always to ask, how is God increasing my faith? And if God has shown me something in the past, am I good at holding on to that and glorifying him and praising him for what he's done in the past and reminding my soul that that same God can work in the present? That is also a way to increase your faith. So I would ask you when you think about if your faith has failed, if you find yourself in a moment where your faith is so limited or you feel like your faith is failing, what has God done before? What have you seen God do before? Remember the way that he's been faithful to you. Praise him and thank him for the way that he has been faithful for you. And you can request a sign to increase your faith if that's what you need. But sometimes the greatest sign of our increased faith is our ability to believe that this moment is a sign. (laughs) Like if you're listening right now, wherever you are in the world, whatever day of the week it is, you might be listening to this six months after it was it was recorded, or you might be listening to it tomorrow. Like whatever it is, this is God reaching out to you. This is God speaking into your circumstances, speaking into your reality, saying, I am with you. I am for you. I will be with you. You are never alone. I am with you. And you can take that as a sign because we have the greatest sign of all, that is Jesus. It says in scripture, this is how you'll know what love is. Christ Jesus laid down his life for you. You never 
have to doubt God's love for you. No matter if you are in the valley of the shadow of death, if you are in the fiery furnace, if you are coming off a victory and you find yourself strangely depressed, if you are just so tired of holding on, if you are trying to persevere right now, if you are in the waiting, whatever it is, God says, I have given you a sign. It is the person of Jesus. He is with you. He can be enough for you. This is your daily bread. Praise me today and trust me with tomorrow. That is what increases our faith. Friends, I don't know who out there this is for. I know for sure it's for me this morning, but I thank you for being here. And I pray right now that for you, wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, we know our Father in heaven sees you and loves you. And that you can take a moment right now to tip your face up and fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, and recommit to following him right now and trust that he is going to show up for you like he does over and over again, because our God is faithful. All right, everyone. Amen. Talk with you next week. How to Study the Bible with Nicole Eunice is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you like what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review the podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com.